Okay. Welcome, Dr. Mangala, once more in this talk. And again, we have guests with us. Para Charles is there, Simon is there, Roman is there, and uh, Karina is also there. And I hope more people will join us today because today's topic is very interesting. So let's begin with the prayer, and then I will hand over this whole time to Dr. Mangala. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, now and ever and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you once again for inviting me to talk to you. I hope you can hear me. Now, the topic is Bhakti today and God, the lover of mankind. Uh, my, my computer is doing funny things. I have to just turn it off. Oh. In the Vedas, um, Hindus seek God through ritualistic prayer and petition. Sorry, there is a roaring noise, and uh, I don't know what Back to normal. Okay. Yeah, it's your time now. Please go on. Today's topic is Bhakti and God, the lover of mankind. And yes. it's going to be interesting because a lot of people, especially in Russia and Europe, uh, they're acquainted with the ISKCON, and that's why maybe it, they will be able to relate with all those things. So thank you, Dr. Mangala. It's your time now. In the Vedas, Hindus seek God through ritualistic prayer and petition. In the Upanishads, a quest for the divine is conducted through meditation on Brahman and speculative logic. The Vedantins like Ramanuja and Madhva insist that Brahman should be approached as the Supreme Lord. They have to argue a case to defend their interpretation. For the notion of Brahman as impersonal dominates. To put differently, the overall ethos of the Upanishads is not theistic. There's only one Upanishad, the last one, Svetasvatera, is theistic, but not the rest. Take, for instance, the famous prayer known as the Shanti prayer in the Brahadaranidka Upanishad. I learned it at school and we used to chant it at uh, assembly time. This prayer is highly popular even to this day, so much so I once heard it as a ringtone in a cell phone of a taxi driver in, uh, in Tamil Nadu. I was quite shocked, I must admit. And it goes like this. Asato ma sadgamaya, tamaso ma jyotirgamaya, mrityo ma mritangamaya, Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Lead me from untruth to truth. Lead me from darkness to light. Lead me from death to life. Peace, peace, peace. It's a very moving triple petition. But who is it addressed to? The appeal of this prayer is lies in, it, in its sense of seeking some divinity out there but at the same time, not being very specific about it as to who it is. It's entirely different in the bhakti tradition. I should say traditions. Uh, bhakti tradition is varied, and yet all of them are totally committed to a belief in God as personal. 
personal in the sense that the divinity relates to humanity in a dialogue of love. This, this way of seeing God is frequently expressed in orthodox prayers in the epithet, God, the lover of mankind. Now, bhakti in the Bhagavad Gita, let me just briefly say what it is. After expounding the discipline of knowledge, jnana yoga, and the discipline of work, karma yoga, Krishna introduces the discipline of devotional love, bhakti. And he elevates bhakti to a higher status. He presents it as the most supreme as well as the simplest and easiest path for all. The focus is on respect, adoration and love, not just human love for God, but God's love for human beings who seek him. So Krishna presenting himself as this loving, caring, personal God repeatedly assures Arjuna, I love the devout man, he says. I quote, bear me in mind, love me and worship me, sacrifice, prostrate yourself to me, so will you truly come to me. I promise you truly, for you are dear to me. The appeal of the Gita stems from this very personal assurance of a very personal God. Verses from the Bhakti Yoga section of the uh, Gita are often cited by Hindu gurus to reassure ordinary people that not every Hindu is called to be a spiritual gymnast, especially the following verse. Patram pushpam phalam toyam yoma bhaktya prayachati tadaham bhakte upakhrutam asnami prayatatmana. If one offers to me, I quote, I translate, if one offers to me with love and devotion a leaf, a flower, fruit or water, I will accept it. Now, the way of devotion has ancient, bhakti has ancient roots but it flowered dramatically from the 5th century onwards and it continues to thrive. In the Padma Purana, Goddess Bhakti declares her origins to the roving ambassador of the gods, Narada. This is what she says. I was born in Dravida country and brought up in Karnataka. For a little while I lived in Maharashtra and became old in Gujarat. There, due to contact with heretics, I got my limbs cut. For a long time, I have grown weak and become dull, along with my son's jnana, knowledge, and vairagya, detachment. O oh, Narada, through luck, I have reached this Vrindavan. I have, as it were, again become a beautiful young girl. This is in Padma Purana, quite a late composition, what, seventh, eight, or perhaps. This Puranic profile indicates succinctly the pan-Indian dimension of bhakti, of its growth, development, and apparent decline and revival. In fact, we need to add all the other states to it, everywhere it is present. What is bhakti? The term bhakti comes from the root bhaj, from bhajan, hence bhajan. Bhaj means to partake of, to be attached to. It also means trust, homage, worship, piety, faith, love. In short, bhakti covers all that is required for a purely devotional, true orient, truly devotional orientation towards the divine. First, bhakti is the most democratic of all Hindu traditions. In contrast to Vedanta, which is somewhat elitist, and requires education, hours of studying uh, sacred writings and debating skills in philosophy, dialectics, and also a disciplinary regimen under a guru. Bhakti, on the other hand, is within the reach of all, the educated as well as the illiterate. It cuts across even caste barriers. So one can say it is the most democratic of all Hindu traditions for it places everyone on the same level before the divine. For example, Mahatma Gandhi used to use the, his, the famous bhajan, 
Raghupati Raghava Raja Ram, you all know it, I presume. Raghupati Raghava Raja Ram, Pati Tapavana Sita Ram, Ishwara Allah Tere Naam, Sabko Sanmadi De Bhagavan. We used to chant it all the time. I don't know whether they do it still. But this chant, where God is presented as having different names but the same God, uh, in fact helped Gandhi to tranquilize a rather varied crowd. Otherwise it might have become a volatile mob. Now Hindu is, he, bring, he used the bhajan to bring unity. Hindu is gurus, irrespective of what brand of Hinduism they teach, they all insist that bhakti is an absolute must, absolute necessity in any quest for the divine. So to sum up, bhakti is that current of spiritual energy which courses through all branches of Hinduism, enriching its traditions, infusing vitality, inspiring reform, renewal and creativity. In bhakti, as in orthodox devotional hymns, there is a very strong relationship between theology and prayer, a symbiotic relationship, a mutual relationship. Let me explain how. I'll quote, for instance, the Troparion for the Feast of the uh, Feast of the Theophany, which uh, in the Orthodox calendar refers to the baptism of Christ. And I, this is the Russian chant used in our Russian church. When you, Lord, were baptized in the Jordan, the worship of the Trinity was made manifest. For the voice of the Father bore witness to you and called you his beloved Son. And the Spirit in the form of a dove confirmed the truth of his word. O Christ our God, who by your appearing has enlightened the whole world, Glory be to you. What makes the orthodox an orthodox Hindu conversation via bhakti is an exciting venture in that both tradition understand a symbiotic relationship between theology and prayer. The bhakti poets would have readily agreed with um, the desert father Ivagrius the solitary who said, if you are a true theologian you will pray truly. If you pray truly, you are a theologian. The theological convictions of the bhakti poets spontaneously inspire their prayers, which is suffused by wonder and praise. Their prayers are kindled by flashes of theological insight, which they invariably see as infusions of divine light granted by grace. We'll see more of it later. <clears throat> the bhakti poets are acutely conscious of the difficulties of uh, expressing what cannot be easily put into words. So they opt for poetry. In this, they resemble those much-loved poet theologians of the Orthodox Christian tradition. St. Gregory of Nazianzus, St. Ephraim the Syrian, St. Simeon the New Theologian, and from more recent history, Mother Maria Skopsova. The reason for opting for poetry by composers of bhakti hymns is the same as with the orthodox writers. The dynamics of poetry in word and rhythm are more suited to conveying mystery, beauty, wonder and paradox. Poetry affords the best means of evoking all the moods and faces of devotional love. Composers of orthodox liturgical hymns are kindred spirits to the best of bhakti poets. One has only to hear the kontakya and tropario for Sundays and feast days, the akathist hymns, the Lenten and Holy Week services, especially those bridegroom matins week before Pascha, where hymns prepare the faithful for meeting Christ as their bridegroom. Such solemn hymns revolve around key biblical motifs drawn from both Old and New Testament which depict the misery, mystery of a suffering God, his victory over death, and the implications of this historical cosmic drama for the individual, for the human race, and for all creation. 
the Paschal midnight prayers are like that. The praises are like that. They dwell on the cosmic implications and which is very necessary. Now, first of all, we have to tackle the problem of Hindu polytheism. The biggest problem for interfaith dialogue between Hindus and Christians is Hindu polytheism. Almost automatically, many Orthodox Christians condemn what they see as Hindu idol worship. Yet most Hindus insist that they are monotheistic. Understandably, non-Hindus ask, how can Hindus call themselves monotheistic when they believe in many gods and worship many idols? I'll attempt an answer. There are countless branches of bhakti, um, but they revolve around countless gods, major and minor. I don't have time for all that, so I thought I'd focus on just two traditions that are familiar to me most. First, the southern Shaivite branch, that is worshippers of Shiva in Tamil, and these are represented by poets called Nayanmas, that means either leaders or hounds, that means dogs, hounds of God, and Kannada poets called Virashaivas. The, uh, they were really very impressive and they wrote poems called Vachanas, means sayings. Second, there is the pan-Indian Vaishnava tradition, devotees of the avatars of Krishna, the avatars of Vishnu, Krishna, Rama and the like. Most Hindus follow one or the other of these traditions. In recent times, uh, preachers have been very keen uh, to discourage sectarian rivalries, which were rife in the past and even violent. Instead, they present cult deities as embodying different aspects of the one supreme God. For instance, Shiva in the icon of the cosmic dancer, the famous bronzes of dance of Shiva, uh, then this icon embodies the awe-inspiring creative energies of God, which pulsates through the universe, destroying evil and bestowing grace. Vishnu represents the friendly aspects of God, tender love and benevolence. He too descends, that is the name, literally avatar, from time to time to quell evil and restore cosmic order. While Shakti displays those qualities of the Godhead that are thought of as feminine. Beauty, grace, erotic and motherly love. Yet as Devi or Kali, she also embodies an awe-inspiring energy that can be creative or destructive, but is always unsettling and unpredictable. Now let's look at dialogue with a personal God. The dialogic mode of seeing human-divine relationship, which depends on conceiving of God as personal, is most commonly associated with the Abrahamic religions, meaning Judaism, Christianity and Islam. Yet the Bhakti traditions also conceive of God as personal, in the sense that the devotee can image the divine as seeking a relationship with human beings. In their great melodic, melodious outpourings, the bhakti poets do conduct a dialogue with God, even if their partner in dialogue is ostensibly a mythic figure. Now, what are they looking for? They're looking for mystical union, a mystical experience. Now, there are two types of mystical experience. The first one, which focuses on inwardly, uh, has a fine phrase coined by the Romanian scholar, scholar Bircea Eliade. He coined the phrase, uh, word term enstasis. Enstasis means in gathering of self. This is what the yogi of the, the Sita Pragna, the spiritual athlete of the Gita, seeks. Enstasis, the in gathering of self, calm, stillness, and whatnot. In contrast, the poets and saints of the uh, Bhakti tradition, the, the Vaishnavite, the Shaivite Nayanmas and the Vaishnavite Arvas, those who dive deep, um, literally, 
these poets and those poets from the north and east of India, Ch Meera, Chaitanya, Jayadev, any number of them who practiced Krishna Bhakti with intense emotionalism sought ecstasy. Now, ecstasy is a passionate union with God, but ecstasy is the state of literally being beside oneself. Let me cite an example from a Tamil poet called Manika Vajra, around 9th century. This is how he describes his tormented love for Shiva. While unperishing love melted my bones, I cried. I shouted again and again, louder than the waves of the billowing sea. I became confused. I fell, I rolled, I wailed, bewildered like a madman, intoxicated like a crazy drunk, so that people were puzzled. Those who heard wondered. Wild as a rutting elephant which cannot be mounted, I could not contain myself. Now, this is a very far cry from Krishna's calm admonition in the Gita to offer a, offer God a leaf, a flower or a water in devotion. The devotee's condition is more like the one described in the Song of Songs in the Bible, the love sickness of, that's portrayed there. The Tamil poet's outpourings are the ravings of one in the phrase, wounded by love. This is the phrase Orthodox Christian writers often use to describe spiritual longing of the human heart once it's struck by the arrow of divine eros, divine love. Now come to idol worship and the question, how does an idol become an icon or vice versa? The poets choose a deity, Ishtadevata, chosen deity. And he's installed, he or she is installed in an image, either in a temple or in a domestic shrine. And the proliferation of temples housing different deities no doubt invites the charge of polytheism. And this charge is valid to some extent in folk devotion or misguided devotion. But more often, the chosen deity serves as an icon of the all-pervasive, invisible presence of the divine. By worshipping the image, the devotee connects to the divine energy that is channeled through the image. In other words, the chosen deity provides what Shakespeare says of poetry, that it gives, quote, a local habitation and a name. The image makes specific the unknowable, ineffable, all-pervasive God and opens a pathway whereby God becomes an intimate companion and guardian. Let me quote some verses. They are chosen from random poems. From wherever and when, from wherever and whenever I, your slave, recall you, you come to be where I am. You become my companion and guardian. You bestow grace, you cut off my karma and you master me. You that are present in Tirukkachipale. Tirukkachipale refers to the particular village where the image is he's addressing. Thus the idol provides a proxy dialogue partner by which bhaktas importune God. For most bhakti poets, this quest for God begins with the specific a particular idol or image in a temple or a home, a local, a very local manifestation of a divine. But it doesn't stop there, nor is it confined to the idol as such. <clears throat> the paradox of being supreme, being polytheist and yet monotheist is described very aptly by uh, Professor Julius Lipner in the phrase polycentric monotheism, polycentric monotheism, that it has many centers, but each centers can act monotheistic as well. This is the same scholar who gave us the image of the great banyan tree. To prove the monotheism of Hindu bhakti is not as difficult as it might seem. To begin with, the phrases and epithets used by the poets clearly indicate that their sites are set high, well beyond an eye, any idol in a temple. When the poet Sambandar speaks of 7th century, 
uh, speaks of Shiva, he's representing, Shiva represents for him everything one might know, experience or say about the one God, who he says has captivated him by his beauty and grace. His favorite phrase is being caught by God, as in a net. Swiftly, deftly, he catches me, he says. And he also says, taking many blessed forms, he possesses us. And then he sees him as the origin of all things, saying, one who from the beginning of time is Lord of all creatures. He also speaks of Shiva as the indweller, one who dwells within all five elements as well as within human beings. In water, in fire, he indwells in the minds of those who invoke him ceaselessly. So monotheism is affirmed again and again. You can't just ignore it. But it's most vigorously promoted by in the tradition of the Virashaivas, the Kannada-speaking uh, poets, I think from 12th century or so, and they take a different approach. There are, for instance, three approaches to temples and sacred sites. The first is to accept with reverence the gods of the temples, treating them as a gateway to the one and true God. The second, which the Virasaiva Bhakti poets do, is to reject all cults of gods and the building of temples, actually mock them in a sarcastic style. I shall be talking. And the third is to treat the human body as a temple of God. I'll talk, say something about each of these ways of coping with temples, gods and idols. The naming of temples and their setting is an important aspect of Tamil Bhakti poets. Why? Because it's a form of thanksgiving. It's a recognition of the superabundant abundant beauty and love of God for his creation. Therefore, the poets dwell on the natural beauty of the temple's environment. Usually, the, the temple is set in a lush landscape with groves of sky-high trees echoing with birdsong with fertile rice fields and streams that swarm with fish, quote, where maidens sport, diving and leaping like the fish. The idol of a named temple is invariably treated as the one supreme, almighty, all-pervasive, grace-bestowing, lord, creator, life-giver, master, savior. <clears throat> Moreover, the god is not only all this, but he actually is a mad, in, in inverted commas, servant of the slaves, that is the Bhakti poets, who seek him. Now, all of this is incredibly charged with emotion, but also with sound theology. There's a good balance between the two. Heart melting with love, I quote from a hymn of Sambandar, uh, who was a seventh century poet. Heart melting with love, eyes brimming with tears, such bhakti leads one to liberation, verily say the Vedas. The truth is enshrined in the holy name of Shiva. You are the beginning, you the end, light of light, the light of those enlightened. Second, the rejecting of gods and temples in the Kannada tradition is quite fun to read them. And they are all available in a penguin edition called Speaking of Shiva, um, edit, translated by A.K. Ramanujan, a very fine scholar. They are a subversive movement. They write, they mock ritualism, temple worship, and write in a rather acerbic, sarcastic, colloquial style. Here is one of them, Basavanna. He expresses contempt for the Hindu tendency to create gods at the drop of a hat and affirms monotheism in no uncertain terms. This is how it goes. The pot is a god, the winnowing fan is a god, the stone in the street is a god, the comb is a god, the bowstring is also a god, the bushel is a god, and the spouted cup is god. Gods, gods, there are so many, there is no place left for a foot. There is only one god, he is our lord of the meeting rivers. 
A third alternative for the Bhakti poet is to treat the human body as a temple of God. This means rejecting outward temple worship and its rituals, but relocating them within the human body. Again, Basavana. The rich will make temples for Shiva. What shall I, poor man, do? My legs are pillars, the body, the shrine, the head, a cupola of gold. Listen, O Lord of the meeting rivers, things standing fall, but the moving ever shall stay. Now, the last two lines are very important. Things standing refer to the temples. Now, the temples are built on the model of the body. You can go into details of the parts of the temple to show that the head, the arms, the chest and the womb house, Gabagraha and so on and so forth. The temple carries out in brick and stone the primordial blueprint of the body. Therefore, things standing refers to the temples, but they fall. But the moving, he's here referring to his own human body, which also is a temple, shall ever stay. Means there's no way it will fall down. It will be perpetually, while alive, worship God. So it's a very clever way of reversing the roles. Similarly, the Tamil poet Upper shared the same notion and he absolutely marvels at the mystery of the human body. And he says, fashioning the bo a bone cage, enclosing nerves within, sheathing all with skin, you formed me to establish me in bliss, cleansing me of my sins. You made my heart a temple, filling this slave of yours with love. You made me yours, such is your grace, O Lord. Yet how have I gone astray, like a man who let go of the hare in sight to chase a crow in flight? Even when a bhakti poet is intensely attached to a specific deity, his or her compositions addressed to that deity clearly come over as appeals to the one supreme God. Next thing is, um, unfortunately, I can't do justice to this aspect, but music plays a key role in bhakti. It's always sung and there's so much music. And I will just two, write two composers, one from the south, one from the north, to give an idea of what this means. Tyagaraja he was an 18th century composer who lived in the Tanjo district, but he actually was from Andhra, Telugu speaking, so his compositions are in Telugu. He was a passionate devotee of Rama and he addressed him in his uh, kirtans, the songs. And he also wrote always like a lover and also with regret and reproach him himself for abandoning, quote, the pure sweet way to the Lord and wandering in stinking dirty alleyways. This, this particular um, composition Sakkani Raja Margamalundaka is very, very popular in the South. And it's set to a very good raga which uh, conveys all the emotions. And he chides the God, where are you? Why are you abandoning me? And then he praises him, rejoices in him. So these songs resemble very much the Psalms in expressing various moods of love, praise, thanks, also anguish, sense of abandonment, abandonment and profound longing. My soul thirsts for the Lord. My soul <coughs> thirsts for the Lord. Thirsts like a, a deer. Um, so it is this profound longing that's intensely felt in the bhajans of Mirabai. You probably all of you know about her, the Rajput princess who, uh, who was so devoted to Krishna, husband tried to poison her, but she survived. In song after song, Mira pours out a deep longing for the Divine, expressing her total surrender to Krishna in a manner that makes it quite clear that for her, Krishna is no mere idol, but stands for the one Supreme God. Her song entitled Baso Mere, this is in Vraj dialect, Baso is Baso, you know, uh, to dwell, dwell in me. She asks Krishna to come and dwell within her eyes as the light of her life. In another one, Hari Avani Ki Avas, she pleads that 
His grace may revive her even as nature itself is renewed. I quote, It is all drizzling, and while the peacock dances to the song of a cuckoo, Mother Earth wears a new look, so should the King of Kings rain his love upon Mira. And then in a playful manner, she says, the one on the screen, If only I were a fish, I would touch your feet as you bathe in the stream. Were I a cuckoo, I would chirp sweetly. When you come to the forest gracing the cattle, if I were a pearl, I would sparkle in your neck as the gem in your necklace. But being any, not being any of these, how am I to get to you? Where am I to seek you? In Piare Dan, she talks about her suffering from a sen sense of deprivation of divine love and asks Krishna to give her a vision, a darshan. I am like a lotus without water or the night without a moon. Pangs of separation torment me day and night. Only show yourself to Mira, your bond slave through endless births. Whether they be songs of praise, pleas of divine mercy, it's hard to dismiss the such soul stirrings as merely devotion to a pagan idol. One hears these songs with some empathy and sung by, but sung by singers whose own bhakti matches that of the composers. I, I believe that they have the same, inspired by the same Holy Spirit that informs Christians at their best in their devotion. Now, the bhakti tradition, already clear, is very strongly a, a theology, endorses a theology of grace. There are a variety of epithets for God's mercy. Arul and Karuna in Tamil, Kripa and Daya in Sanskrit, Hindi, Tamil and many other in Indian languages. Such words emphasize the primacy of God's grace in any quest for the divine. In a poem, uh, by the Kannada poet, he, the poet urges listeners to watch out for the signs of grace using a very well-known common proverb. When you talk about winnowing while the wind blows, he uses that. Winnow, winnow, look here fellows, winnow when the wind blows. Remember, the winds are not in your hands. Remember, you cannot say, I will winnow, I will winnow tomorrow. When the winds of the Lord's grace lash, quickly, quickly, winnow, winnow, said Chaudhaya of the ferryman. Now let's look at the convergence and divergence. I can see three meeting points. The phrase, God is the lover of mankind, I've already mentioned this, that the bhakti poets see God as personal, as a lover, as a God of love. And in the Orthodox service, we use this phrase, God is the lover of mankind. <clears throat> the second is Christ the Pantocrata, the icon of Christ as the cosmic Christ. Orthodox Christians are very well placed to an enlarged vision of cosmic Christ through the icons, especially those that depict Christos Pantocrator, Christ the Almighty, the ruler of all, the sustainer of all things. An icon not only depicts some sacred event or holy person, but is also designed to enable devotees to contemplate God's comprehensive plan of salvation for all, as conceived in eternity. Similarly, Orthodox liturgical celebrations, especially during Pascha, Easter in the West, exult in a joyful, exuberant manner over the cosmic aspect of Christ's victory over death and the anticipated transfiguration of all creation. In Orthodox writings, there is no doubt the, a strong emphasis of the Church as the means to salvation, to the Christian's deification, and yet there is a welcome degree of openness when it comes to discussing the spiritual plight of those who are outside of churches, earthly bounds. I, I am aware that some Orthodox condemns everybody else, but there are also a number of Orthodox hierarchs and bishops who have a much more, and elders who have an open-mindedness. 
One Orthodox I know uh, like to say, we don't proselytize, we witness. Mission is to be done in the spirit of come and see, as Philip said to Nathaniel. In my experience of India, uh, Hindu India, meeting Christians, one fine example was given by the monk Ignati, he's now Bishop of Madagascar, uh, who worked together with Sister Nectaria uh, Paradisi uh, in Calcutta. They revived an old decaying church in Calcutta, restored it, and founded an orphanage uh, for abandoned children in a village nearby. There it was not preaching, but simply serving the liturgy, serving, doing the services. It was the beauty of holiness with open doors that attracted people who came, started coming in and then asking questions. And a number of Hindus were converted through the beauty of holiness, through the services. So the quality of bhakti joined with a practice of unconditional love to all, bearing in mind Christ cannot be confined within the four walls of a church or imprisoned, we are not God's bodyguards, and this would enable proper ongoing dialogue. Now there is a third point, which is a more subtle one, but worth exploring, which is the orthodox view of last judgment. Now, if you remember, bhakti seeks a way of cutting off the whole cord of karma, which binds people into repeated births. Bhakti wants to have one one act which will simply get them out of karma, not going through endless births, by seeking grace, seeking divine illumination. Now, in the orthodox theology, the prospect of future judgment is taken very seriously indeed. Uh, we see the Lenten, Kutaki, Lenten Kontakian speaks about the universe trembling of a river of fire flowing from God's judgment seat. Yet, there is no simplistic consignment of humankind into heaven and hell as regions, as areas of bliss or torment. In general, orthodox writers avoid an externally imposed punishment, but rather speak in terms of the soul's variable receptivity to the perpetual, unconditional and, quote, burning love of God. God's bright beam of love purifies and enlightens those who turn to him and seek him. But the same burning love, laser-like, seals and torments those who reject him and cling to their own obdurate self-will. As uh, the character of Mephistopheles said in a play by Marlowe, Dr. Faustus, this is hell, neither am I out of it, meaning himself. This side of subtle theological approach accords better with uh, uh, the sensibilities nurtured on the bhakti tradition, where God is the ever-loving bestower of grace, and any judgment or punishment undergone by the devotee is there seen as an inevitable consequence of his on his own ego to our own inner darkness that blots out God's light and love. So Hindu bhakti and orthodox theology at their best steer from the crude notions of a vengeful condemnatory deity who consigns human beings to heaven or hell. This is a notion unfortunately Christians of all too often think associate with Christianity as a whole. So sum up the nodes of convergence between Christians and Hindus, a monotheistic perception of God as creator, sustainer and savior, a strong emphasis on the primacy of grace and the necessity of synergic cooperation with God's will, the ideal of God as a devotee's constant companion, the concept of the body as a temple where God may dwell, the emphasis on inner worship in spirit and truth and love, singing praises, chanting the name of God, Jesus' prayer, rehearsing the attributes of the deity, a stress on the need for conversion, metanoia, turning to God, and finally, an evangelical zeal for bringing others to love and worship. There's a great deal of group activity in the bhakti traditions. Now, what are the divergences? As usual, 
And I'll repeat it again. The Christian insistence that Jesus Christ is the one and only incarnation of God presents an annoying challenge to Hindus who like to see him as just one more avatar. Avatars represent periodic descent of the divine. They are said to come to destroy evil, restore, save the good and restore dharma. Christ came once and for all and while yet we are sinners. He came to rescue us, to restore us to what we are meant to be, an image of God, and grant us the kingdom of God. I've already spoken about why Christians insist on Jesus Christ being unique. How can we convey this? I recommend the prayer we sing in the Divine Liturgy, which begins, sing or recite, Only Begotten Son and Word of God. It sums up the entire theology in a very short prayer. And it's a useful way to start. Bhakti is life-affirming, no doubt. But yet, as you have heard, even in the phraseology, it's trapped in the double doctrine of karma and rebirths. And those fault lines of Hindu view of the individual as well as creation that I spoke about in the last two talks. So if you want to know why that is defective, go back to those talks. This divides. This is the divergence. So at its best, Bhakti pours out love, but there's also with emotion. But emotion balanced with good theology becomes a gritty prayer. But emotion cut loose becomes sickly sweet, sentimental, dreamy, escapist. Now, the Christian Bhakti is infused by the agony of the crucifixion. And therefore, Christian elders speak of our joy as a sorrowful joy while we await the general resurrection. The Paschal Truparian, Christ is risen from the dead, is triumphal. Yet the experience depends on the sacrificial love of God-man, of our God-man on the cross. Unlike an avatar, God became incarnate at a specific place, at a specific time, in history, witnessed and recorded and proclaimed by the church. Yet, big yet, neither history nor a particular place can contain him. He who rose from the dead offers salvation and eternal life to all who come to him in all places and at all times. So a Hindu convert, convert to Christ once, I can't recall his name or where from, but after he attended a church service, he said, I found here the name of the one I have been seeking all my life as a devout Hindu. Let us pray that we, come, we become worthy ambassadors of Christ, that lovely phrase of St. Paul's, ambassadors of Christ to Hindus who pursue the path of bhakti. Now, um, I've finished the talk and can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear. Right. Well, do you want me to sing the Truparya now? <laughs> uh, as you wish, maybe, maybe today or as you said at the end of the talk, uh, at a series of talks. Okay. There, I hope the uh, microphone, the, uh, the internet holds. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, uh, let's do it today then. Uh, we don't know where, how, how the internet will work in the future. So uh, today is good. So let's sing yeah. now. <laughs> okay. Give me a minute. Uh, mm. Yeshu Christo. Maritoril irund, yerund dollar, tan maranatin mulum, maranatay arit, kalarai sar dawar, uiralitar, ye sukhisto, maritoril irund, yerund dollar, yerund There you go. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Thank you so much. I could see Father, Father uh, Charles was hypnotized by, <laughs> by, by the <laughs> It's set to a raga called Shanmuga Priya, you know, which is uh, very popular. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, may I ask the first question? Uh, yes. It's uh, not more about the theology, it's about uh, like uh, what makes people in the West uh, attracted towards the Bhakti tradition, especially which is expressed in ISKCON and not towards Christianity. Uh, there are two things to be said about the 
Krishna consciousness people. Uh, first of all, they they allow a lot of uh, beautiful rituals. Beautiful in the sense, the kirtan, for instance, the bhajan, the music, the kind of companionship, um, and they offer all this, and they, their whole way of life is centered on a kind of the what do you call it the uh, Krishna bhakti, and it's the one the great emphasis on beauty there. Yeah. But I would say deeper than that is the Krishna conscious the, that particular movement. In fact, they like other sects, like the Jehovah's Witnesses and others and similar ones, offer a very clear sectarian identity to the people. We, Dhamma and us, is very strong in that kind of approach because they call, uh, the, they use the phrase, uh, the founder used to use the phrase Mlecha. Mlecha means uh, non-Sanskrit speakers originally, but it's a kind of a fairly contemptuous term for the rest of the world, those who are not within the group. Now they call, they have a mission to convert the mechas, mlechas. And I think people feel they are given a kind of a, an identity within the group. And they are given a very, also, uh, they, they are given a very um, dualistic approach. The Krishna consciousness, actually, their writings and everything is very clear about uh, heaven and hell and body and soul and matter and spirit and clear cut and it's the same attraction as with any mystery cults and dualistic cults in the ancient uh, pagan world you had a special group which seeks an experience but they are the kind of a selected ones cut off from the rest of the world and in ordinary proselytizing terms they offer uh, they uh, they have this, uh, what do they call the vegetarian food and their services and all the rest of it. That is a kind of a uh, door in, invitation to call in. But unfortunately, I'm afraid all is not all it seems. I have heard of what I would call casualty, casualties to the Krishna consciousness. Now, I know one extreme case is they, they were reported to have been uh, hailing somebody as being enlightened, enlightened person, and so on and so forth, because this, the person was behaving in ways which were not normal. They seemed to be mystical to them, but later it turned out the poor chap was simply suffering from brain tumor. And so, I mean, Rajneesh was a very great critic of all Hindu rituals and whatever he used to say. People who practice yoga and do headstands think that they are enlightened. In fact, they've just damaged their blood vessels in their head. And he used to mock it as well. So what I'm saying is there are the same kind of difficulties you have and dangers in any cults you will have with the Krishna cult. But basically, it offers a special status, beauty in worship, communal living and communal doing, like any ashrams and so on. You, you belong to a community of a special status and you're promised heaven in a fairly simple way. And I think that's that's my reading of it. From what I, I remember, once accosted by one of them trying selling me a Bhagavad Gita in the streets, and um, years ago, and I felt sorry for him. And I said, "Okay, I'll buy you a copy because I want to know how your uh, leader has translated it. I'm doing some work on translations of the Bhagavad Gita, so I bought a copy." But I said to him, "You know what? This is all a poetic quest. It's a poetic quest for the divine. It's poetry. It's in a." It's not history. It's not the real incarnation. If you really want to know how this actually can be done and how you can actually get what is promised here, you should read the New Testament. You should go to the church. He looked absolutely staggered. And uh, and then that was it. That was my one attempt at at least conducting some kind of a dialogue. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for that answer. Thank you. Uh, one more question uh, related to Bhakti movement. Uh, I don't know if it is related to that exactly or not, but uh, in Maharashtra, uh, yeah. I, I'm sure there are in other states as well. Uh, people started uh, venerating and even calling gods to some people who were psychologically ill uh, or the mentally ill people. For example, the Gajanan Maharaj in, in, in India, uh, sorry, in Maharashtra and mm. Anusya Mata also. They were like mentally ill people. 
uh, but people started worshipping them, attributing some miracles to them and then started bhajan and etc. All those things around them. Mm. So what makes people think that these people are divine or having something divine in them? Well, you know what? This is the Indian version of the Holy Fool. Uh, in the West, in the Christian traditions, especially uh, in the Orthodox tradition, you will find uh, uh, this particular type of person who rejects conventional uh, society, even conventional church, and behaves in ways which uh, look very odd. And they have, in fact, you are even celebrated some holy fools in the current calendar. But they have certain qualities of total trust in God and constant prayer, and they don't necessarily abide by the rules and regulations. But they have, they have spirituality of a kind, like a wandering monk or a wandering, uh, there was one lady, I can't remember her name, a men and women who seek God all the time. They are credited with this quality of having um, the divine in them. And often, that is probably genuinely true, but there are also, for every true person, there's always some fake. But here, it's that idea that, that the really devout person doesn't care about the world, doesn't care about what other people are pursuing, and they are otherworldly. And so, if you are mentally ill, uh, you probably are not as tuned into all their everyday things as other people are. So, the tendency is to see them as divine. And, uh, but I would add to that, I sometimes see disabled people, uh, meaning um, in, you know, at work and others. Um, I have one friend who has a, uh, I would say, slightly autistic or whatever, the Asperger um, child, young man now. He is unconventional. He's not divine, but he has an uncanny insight into people's character. He quickly understands the spiritual condition of somebody else. And he'll say it as well out loud in a somewhat shocking way. And so there is some gift he has which saner people don't have. Ultimately, any insight of that kind comes from God. So if mentally ill people probably have some of that, then, you know, they become divine in the independent. So it's, it's a complex story. Yeah. God may not give them other faculties, but he gives them something else. And, um, and some people with Down syndrome, this is very well attested, are extremely loving people. They, they are incredibly loving in their attitude to other people. They may suffer other ways, but they don't in that way. So this makes a question, what does it really mean to be an image of God? You begin to think in different ways. It's to be insightful, to be loving, to be intelligent in other ways than we think we are, you know. And so it, it's, it opens up a lot of issues. I don't have all the answers, but I can just uh, indicate where they are. Yeah, thank you. Uh, does anybody have any question? Please go ahead and ask. Dr. You, you focused interestingly on the, as it were, uh, theological uh, points of contact and differentiation or divergence. Um, what about in the moral sphere? Sorry? The? What about the moral sphere? Mo moral sphere? Yeah. Um, you mean you're asking about the bhakti poets? Well, I think what I'm really asking is, do, do Hindus, and let's just say the bhakti tradition, uh, yeah. since you focused on that today, mm -hmm. um, do, does it find any particular impediment in, in what we would think of as the Christian moral tradition, you know, broadly speaking? Well, you see, I, I take the view, there are two things to be said here. There is a strand of bhakti, which in fact, uh, there's one um, fine example in Bengali tradition, I can't recollect immediately what the name of the person is, where uh, the bhakti is expressed in terms of uh, defying conventional morality. I mean, there's a, there is a way in which you break the bounds of eth ethical perfection and 
and and you are a you may be uh, and this particularly the in the krishna radha tradition this is exalted because the radha never existed I mean, what i mean is radha is a poetic character created by in the middle ages developed from the original krishna image and the whole focus is on illicit relationship it's not a married relationship or anything it's actually an illicit relationship and the whole idea is that you have and the whole picture of uh, krishna depriving all the gopis of their clothes when they are bathing uh, in the western missionaries used to be shocked by this image what on earth is this you know what kind of an immoral god is but in fact hindus never were bothered by that or are not bothered by that the reason is they understand what it's about it says you have to be naked before god if you take krishna to be god you have to be shed your clothes you beg for your clothes back so i mean that's interpretation i was brought up on i never ever imagined and i used to think the westerners are so crude you know they ever interpret everything in say in terms of sex they yeah. cannot see beyond that yeah, this is my hindu reaction and uh -huh. i still is to some degree you know they cannot think they're out of that box and, uh, and you ask any hindu interpreter uh, he's a, well, oh you're uh, worshiping the phallus well it was never that you know the linga was a symbol okay and uh, what's so terrible about it you know uh, it's part of the human body and uh, i couldn't understand and similarly i cannot still understand why uh, words which mean uh, applied to sex are used as abuse you know and um, again i cannot understand that anyway there are a lot of things i can say about this but in that tradition deliberately the transcending uh, morality is idealized mm. but it doesn't mean that hindu in the bhakti tradition in general um discards morality not at all they live perfectly normal lives and they wouldn't have much difficulty with the new testament way of seeing what true morality is which is christ's way is places love before law mm -hmm. and or rather law being transformed into love and he has every everything he says centers around this that don't be bound by the letter but keep the spirit so they would find that perfectly at home with that you know it is not one one singer says what is the point of me going to uh, do this and that and good works and going to kashi and um, dunking in the ganges and all right is this going to save me no <laughs> but true worship of my god is what is going to save me so they won't have any difficulty what i would call the true message of christ not at all but if it's a question of narrowly interpreting it as i've given some examples and thou shalt not kind of way uh, they might flinch from it just as we should flinch from it mm -hmm. and we shall cling on to the love your god and love your neighbor rather than the thou shalt not and he, in the sermon on the mount he's just extending it all the time to see um John Chrysostom has a lovely phrase where he says in the same way as he healed the crippled and the sick and the maimed he heals the law so that we can fully realize it heals the law it's a lovely way of looking at it the law has been broken and damaged and misapplied and misappropriated he heals the law that's what he means when he says it. so i don't think so there were there is this understanding which is also there in the in the song of songs that that expresses why do the people uh while the white the scholars the biblical scholars kept that in the bible because there is a dimension of love which is not necessarily bound up by conventional rules and things and uh, they understood this and so they kept it mm -hmm. so i i would say there is two, two many dimensions to this but uh, i hope i've answered some of it <laughs> oh, no, thank you for that 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 yeah. scope appreciate mm -hmm. that. Yes. Can you, uh, yeah. I my question is uh, related to uh, what uh, Father Charles asked. Uh, so uh, I did this course uh, in Bhakti actually. So uh -huh. I, uh, I read a few of the Bhakti poets and their. Uh, I'm familiar with uh, some of their radiographies and all. Uh, mm. What 
I found, the kind of difference that I found between orthodox spirituality and uh, Prakti spirituality is that uh, yeah, it's, I mean, uh, 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 reading their poetry and reading about their experiences, it seems to be focused too much upon um, their imagination and their experience. Uh, it mm. uh, seems to be, uh, you know, what uh, orthodox writers like uh, Ignatius Bryanchin, you know, uh, mm. and others characterize as a uh, pre-list. Uh, pre uh, illusion, so. Uh, so, uh, it felt like that for, uh, to me actually, but uh, how they uh, address God in a certain way and all, which uh, it seems quite foreign to, uh, when we think from an orthodox perspective, where the, uh, where the saints actually always address him with humility and repentance is a uh, central to uh, orthodox spirituality and, uh, and imagination is and fantasy is seen as something as something uh, you know yeah. uh, foreign to it so mm. uh, do you comment upon that well thank you it's a very important question ultimately that is why it fails meaning so much depends on the imagination, so much depends on the myths and so much depends on the stories and when you get tired of them, uh, you are left with a sense of dissatisfaction. But I would say, um, I wouldn't call it so much prelist because these people were often uh, good people and I don't think they were deceived in the sense they it was not an egotistical thing with them. It's not their ego that's playing the part. The system is failing them in the sense that they haven't got the adequate figure, which is only in Christ. So I wouldn't call it prelist myself, but excessive imagination, yes, it's sickly. And um, um, I, I can't stand the Brindavan Krishna cults. Uh, I, that's a personal uh, reaction because I find the whole thing is just a fantasy, you know, and uh, a never, never land, you know, and, and, and I just can't do that. But what I would also say is, that imagination, um, for instance, if you are using a poetic method, you use your imagination, you don't discard it. If you read, for instance, the poems of St. Ephraim the Syrian, um, do you know them? Don't know? Yes, yes. Yeah, well, if you look at it, he uses his imagination, it's not prelist. What I mean is, he uses the image of the pearl, he uses the image of the diver, he uses the image of any number of images he uses to talk about to talk theology, and they are perfectly, they can be done perfectly well. Similarly, as for the emotionalism, I didn't have time to talk about it, but if you look at the practice of the Orthodox Church, uh, particularly the Good Friday services in the Greek and the Antiochian services, we have this wonderful thing called the Lamentations. I don't know whether you're familiar with it, but yes. the, la the Lamentations are in fact the great highlight of the, the whole of Pascha service for many churches. They gather and they sing, I love them, we all join in, we sing. And the Lamentations again depend, the verses are dialogue between the Mother of God and, and the Christ figure and, they, they, and, in, and, the, and the audience itself, imagining the situation of, and wondering, you know, how can it be, there are question and answer. But the only difference between that and what I would call some excessive emotionalism in uh, some, some certain Catholic uh, manifestations is the theology has always to be gritty. What I call gritty means it shouldn't lose the intellectual aspect. It should have that, the ideas, the doctrines, the concepts. Once you have a proper balance, as you have in English metaphysical poetry, what is called metaphysical poetry, thought and feeling, metaphysical, finely blended, then there is no problem. And Orthodox services have these as well, these, um, uh, and um, maybe the Akathist hymns as well, you know, you have, and you have a lot of Theotokos related uh, melodies and singing, which you would, could be compared. So I would say, prelist is too extreme a uh, reaction, but imagination does go uh, that has to be balanced with proper theology and proper control of the emotions, but it shouldn't be ruled out. And beauty is the other thing. The music is a dimension we haven't 
been able to explore yet. I'm not quite sure how we do it. That is an absolutely important part of Orthodox worship. And so is it in Bhakti. So again, you can't call that. Reading poets are not the same as actually listening to them sung. And just put on a good version of Mira or Jalota or somebody, you'll see the difference, you know, uh, as to how it comes over. So I think realist is a different type. It's egocentric and false imagination. But I do agree with you, the myths fail. That's why I gave up in the end, you know, this is not enough, good enough. You know. And when I go to my Hindu family, my sister is a very good singer and loves music. We share the music, but I have to stay and stay clear of the what the music is talking about, because the address of God and so on, uh, we can say, this person sings with a good bhakti and this person doesn't have the bhakti. This is how she talks. And uh, so I can share it with her, but I can't actually share the theology behind that bhakti. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, could you comment uh, uh, in the same vein, uh, could you comment upon the erotic aspect of bhakti too? Be uh, oh, because, yes. Oh, yeah. yes. I, I have written, uh, I, I don't know, it sounds like it. I wrote an article some years ago called, Who is Afraid of the Song of Songs? You know. Uh, like who's afraid of Virginia Woolf is a copy. The erotic aspect is something that is there in the biblical tradition. Um, I would say the Song of Songs is actually an, should be treated as a poem that is an icon in the sense it is a poem, it talks about wedding uh, lovers, it talks about meeting and parting and all the rest of it, it's very sensuous, all of that is true but it's also pointing to something more than that. And that is, in that sense, it's an, an iconic reading of the Song of Songs would enrich our lives. Now, as I said to uh, Father Charles, the problem with the erotic in, um, uh, in, the, in the Indian traditions is that, as in the the only one I know where it's really strong is the Krishna traditions, and um, I have my reservations about it for other reasons, not just because it's erotic, because it cuts off. It, it has a very, um, as if uh, you put your mind to sleep, you know, and it has, it's, it has kind of a saccharine quality about it, uh, like you're having too many sweets, you know. And, that. <laughs> and, and the problem is, in the images of the erotic goddesses, uh, particularly, uh, we need to uh, uh, we need to have a whole talk on just the, that subject, the Shakti and the, the the goddess worship and the role of the erotic in in religion. And I think Christianity has suffered a lot from being a puritanical about it, and not a healthy uh, approach at all. A lot of it. And it's all tied up with uh, original sin doctrines and other such things. I can't really go into it, but there needs to be a better understanding of that. I I remember when the arguments about in favor of uh, um, God as female was being discussed during the debates about ordination of women thing. I challenged one of a one very big evangelist leader saying. You all, peop you people like to talk about the motherly qualities and whatnot. When are you going to tackle the erotic? <laughs> I said to him, <laughs> and uh, oh, and the implications of it for doing something like this. And uh, he just didn't have an answer. It's a very muddled area for Christians, and it's a uh, it's not as dominant, I would say, in the actual um, what do you call it, um, the bhakti poets I know of, and so on. But we do need to discuss it more properly, I don't think I can give any short answers to that, because our problems are on both sides. Mm, yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you. Thank you for answering mm. it. And thank you for uh, singing that uh, Truparian. I, I really liked it. Thank you. <laughs> Good. Thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure. <laughs> yeah, one more question from me. Mm. Is that uh, a few years ago, I, uh, there was a video circulated on uh, news channels and on internet it is still available mm -hmm. that uh, uh, an ex uh, Delhi police commissioner started mm -hmm. uh, Krishna Bhakti. He went, uh, no, I mean, he was so much uh, immersed in Krishna Bhakti that he uh, put on women's clothes 
and started calling himself uh, Radha. Mm -hmm. And uh, and people who justified, they said, this is the way uh, we should uh, devote ourselves to Krishna, becoming Radha or becoming a gopi. Mm -hmm. Is that, the, I mean, is it the real understanding of bhakti, uh, uh, I mean, bhakti tradition to to go to God or to approach God in a, uh, what is it, uh, like in an uh, imagery of uh, husband and wife, or mm -hmm. it can be something else also? Well, you know, um, I actually wrote a novel. Um, I've, I've written some novels, and the second one called um, is called Transcendental Pastimes. It's about a guru and um, um, uh, who claims he knows his past lives and and his life is being documented by a group of uh, Western filmmakers, documentary makers. Anyway, in that, I also have an alternative guru who is who does this, this Krishna Bhakti thing, and all his people dress up as gopis and they have dances and this, that, and the other. Well, I, I being a rather reserved South Indian Tamil, <laughs> I have to say this, <laughs> my my family and are a bit austere and I've inherited the temperament. I, to be honest, I find it in bad taste. <laughs> That's all. I, I find it in bad taste in the sense it becomes an excuse for indulging in whatever fetishes you have. You know, you may want to cross dress or you may want to abandon your duties. You may want to opt out. And it's more often than not, it comes over not as bhakti, but as some excuse for doing something else. And um, seems to be the case with this police commissioner, I don't really know. But he probably had enough of the world and he wanted to escape. And it's escapism. And um, I don't think uh, it's actually real bhakti. Real bhakti is not escapism. It, it actually involves a lot of discipline and a lot of uh, self-examination and a lot of interior questioning, uh, all of which I didn't have time to talk about, but all these poets do that. So. Your short answer is no. I think it's it's a it's it's a it's a indulging in something which, in a tradition which encourages that. That is why I didn't uh, talk about it because I'm really critical of it rather severely. Probably upset all the Krishna devotees of Jayadeva and so on. The whole Krishna Radha traditions have created all these things, and uh, and unfortunate. I would say it's unfortunate. Yes. Thank you for that answer. Uh, I have a question from Sergei Gerashenko from, from Russia. He yeah. says, Dear Christine, Christ, uh, Christian theology is formulated using the concepts of Greek pre-Christian philosophy. Is it possible to formulate Christian teaching using the concepts of Indian philosophy? And if yes, is it is it advisable? I am specially interested in the concepts of Satya, Rita and Dharma. Um. I think yes. The answer is uh, yes, uh, yes and no. <laughs> um, I think well, I'm hoping uh, in the future to talk about some concepts and things like that in the talk on theosis. We'll look at that. There is one southern theologian, uh, Christian theologian, um, in the south, in the Kerala Kottayam School of Theology, I've called it, has attempted it and. Unfortunately, they tend to be, uh, they, you can't take a term out of the context. He does a good job, by the way, I have to, I'll come to that later in the talk, not here. As for using words like satya, dharma, and these, in itself, because he is a Russian, he will see it as a term that can be used. But for an Indian, Every concept comes with a whole baggage, their background, where they are used, how they are used. And therefore, if you say satya, truth. Now, for truth can be talked about in an abstract kind of way, which philosophy and some type of theology do. But ultimately for Christians, truth is Christ. I am the way, the life and truth. Truth is not an abstraction, it's a person. This big difference means every time you say something, you have to say, but in the Indian context, this means dharma, for instance, relates to a, a cosmic 
moral law. But that cosmos is a repetitive cyclical cosmos. It's not the cosmos that the Christians are talking about. So every time you use a word, it's like karma. Why can't we use karma? Because it comes with rebirth. And so <laughs> what I'm trying to get at is, for instance, I'll, I'll tell you a short example. I, in my book on the final chapter, towards the end, I do a comparison, uh, I do a short exposition of a Lord's Prayer translated into Sanskrit, uh, which uses Sanskrit terms to, to do the Lord's Prayer. And it can be done, but there are problems, because as soon as you, use the, you come to the word Our Father in Heaven, how do you describe Heaven? There are two options. You can call it Swarga or Vyoma. So each means different in the Hindu context. Swarga means a heavenly abode, and there are lots of uh, types of Swarga, and it's also not the ultimate end, it's only a transit hotel. You know, you go to Swarga and then you come back to be born again. And Vyoma is a kind of a sky, and it doesn't contain any specificity. There's no communion room for communion of saints or uh, experience of God in the kingdom or any of those things. So as what I'm generally getting at is, as soon as you choose a term, what do you do with all the associations that come with it? That is the main problem. If you are prepared to do all that, okay, you can point in that direction. But you cannot use them, simply take them and plant them. So, I think for good or ill, we have what we have. But, I will say a big but, I don't think Christian faith depends on Greek theology, Greek philosophy. I mean, Christian faith is in the New Testament and you can read it. You don't have to have an ounce of Greek theology, you can still be a Christian. Thank you for that answer. Mm -hmm. uh, one more question based on that one, uh, the answer you gave. Uh, it's about the translation, because anyhow, it's uh, inescapable when you are in different culture, when you are... Yeah. Your, it's for, be it for yourself, be it for others. You, you translate some things into your own language. Yes. And then you have to employ some terms. That mm -hmm. difficulty I always feel, feel, because there are a lot of Greek terms which we don't have in our languages. So mm -hmm. I try to borrow something that is similar in, in, in Sanskrit. Mm -hmm. uh, so I do that uh, sometimes, but uh, I do check the context, what it means in something. But uh, but anyhow, I have to use something which is at least something similar to give an idea what it means. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, be because you know, otherwise it will be not possible to convey uh, yes. uh, the yes. Christian meaning or idea. Yeah. Mm. So in, uh, regarding the translation, uh, for example, in Marathi Bible, um, the God is called uh, the Yahweh. Yehovah mm -hmm. is translated as uh, Parmeshwar, and usually I, what I, according to my reading, uh, the Shiva is called Ishwara or Parmeshwara. So yeah. is is that permissible uh, for Christians to use that word? Parmeshwar, yeah, it literally means the prime God, the first God. Yes, I, I, um, for instance, uh, I use Tamil words for God. And I can't speak for. And Ishwar is a perfectly good, proper word to use for God, so long as uh, Parameshwar is, you know, supreme Lord, supreme God. Yes, and I we have a different sort of word. We have a very fine word which is Kadavul. Kadavul is God in Tamil. Kadavul actually means inner outer. Literally, it means inside outside. Kada is outside. Ul is inside. And to me. The Tamil word actually captures the Christian uh, uh, notion of a, a transcendent and an imminent God at once in one word. Um, Swami is all again pan-Indian, isn't it? We use Swami everywhere. Um, I think one has to, uh, what uh, Alexander Schmemann used to say, and I think he's right, is our job is not to destroy paganism or pagan words and things, it's to baptize them. <laughs> That's what he used to say, something similar, can't remember his exact words. So I think we are there to give these words new content. So that's what has to be done. But yet there are problems, there's no question about it. Yes. I mean, I, I'll tell you a joke, uh, this actually happened. The famous Roman Catholic uh, Jesuit scholar Raymond Panica at one of these uh, big international gatherings in Vatican, met an African bishop who said, you know, we have real difficulty. Uh, we don't have words in Africa 
for hypostasis and essence and all these things. And he was very worried. And Panikkar said, how blessed you are. <laughs> that was his reaction. <laughs> you are blessed, he said, because they have caused a lot of trouble as well as doing good. Like separating the Oriental churches from the Macedonian churches. Those words, you know, the Greek terms. So I think it's not always uh, one way. I always recollect his comment, how blessed you are. Is it? <laughs> That's truly. <laughs> yeah. well, so don't worry uh, about, don't worry about the dominance of the, the Greek terms, so long as the, what is meant is captured and, and equally good. Hey, you have a big challenge. I'm, I'm, I worked with my husband, uh, rather, I was an assistant, when they did a liturgical translation of the Psalms for the Church of England years ago, which is still available. You stand a recording of it and it's available on Audible and so on. They had a panel of uh, eight or nine Hebrew scholars, Semitic scholars who had more than Hebrew, and among them was um, the famous uh, lovely person, um, Sebastian Brock from Oxford, who was a good friend of ours, Syriac scholar. And they translated every sentence by referring to about 20 different versions of it. I, my job was to collate 20 versions before computers came. So I used to sit there with 20 copies of the versions, copy them, and see how they translated each word. Then it would go to the panel, and they would, the Hebrew, eminent Hebrew scholar John Emerton was the chairman. They would talk and talk for a whole day over one line. And then they produced a crib. My husband's job was to put it into poetic English, so he'd come back and try and put it into poetic English, that was because he's an English literature man, take it back, and they re-examine whether anything was lost. So this, this complex it was to do just the Psalms. So we lived through it for a whole year doing this. So I don't envy your job, but God help you. I mean, uh, in, but I, I would say, discover the riches of your own language. That's one way of, you know, if you have the richness there, God surely has provided something, you know. He doesn't want you to be Greek or Russian or anything else. He wants you to be Maharashtrian. <laughs> so so I, had, I would say pray and help, but there are problems. No, no, no point in underestimating them. I ran into trouble even doing heaven, you know. I didn't know what to do. I, I just had to pro point out the problem. <laughs> you know, it's not Swarga, it's not Vyoba, but what is it? I don't know. <laughs> so, there we are. Hmm. Sometimes you have to create a new word, you know. Hmm. It's frozen now. Yeah. Uh, sorry, yeah, I am here. I had an internet problem. Uh, can you can you, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear. Uh, regarding the same, I had a, I mean, I had that difficulty. I mean, I, I often face that one, especially when when I wanted to translate the word epiclesis. We have the word uh, this avahan. Yeah, I don't know if there is, it is in other languages, but avahan Sorry? carries. Avahan. Avahan. Yeah, that's Sanskrit yeah. word. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But uh, I don't know how what what meaning it carries uh, in Sanskrit, but in Marathi it carries a negative meaning, like calling upon some evil spirits. Uh, so I when I was trying, yeah, we don't have so, that association. It just uh -huh. means the invisible spirit, Avahana. <laughs> not yeah. not but here, not visible, yeah. you know. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Especially this word is used here in context of black magic. Hmm. When you call upon something, it does it, yeah. So that's difficult that's, for you if that's what it has the associations. We do have to watch the associations because sometimes you otherwise a perfectly innocuous word can turn into a silly joke if you don't watch the associations, you know. And um, uh, uh, for instance, in English, uh, uh, people say uh, about the dog, they take a dog for a walk to the park and and the dog does its business, they say, you know. When the, yeah. Yeah. And we came across it in one of the psalm translations produced by a group here. On the great seas, you do your business, you know. And it sounded ridiculous. And not only ridiculous, it reminded you of dog walking. So I'm just saying there are, <laughs> if you have evil associations, um, 
unfortunately, you, you have to stay clear of it. You know, it doesn't work. And uh, so, uh, good luck to you. Uh, good, well, God's blessings on you to find another. <laughs> Thank you. And by the way, the same word applies to this uh, word Theotokos also, although it means it, it is literally is God bearer. <clears throat> but uh, when I translate like mother of God, uh, you know, in our culture, it, the mother of God also becomes a goddess. So when, when I. Mm. Uh, what, say, what's the word like, you the, use? Not or? just the. Uh, I, I use the word <clears throat> Isha Janani. Yeah, you should generally, well, that becomes another goddess? No, really? uh, No, I mean, uh, because, no, here, <clears throat> a god, uh, a god's mother is usually, yeah. not every time, but usually is a uh, goddess. Do the Hindi, Hindi, how, what does it do, do in Hindi? Uh, do you know? Uh, in Hindi, they have Ishmata, uh, uh, I mean, in the Catholic translations. Yeah, Ishmata, that's just uh, mother of God, Ishmata. Yeah. Ish is is janani is better to, uh, yeah yeah is janani better uh, mm. the one who gives birth to god yeah. that's why i, I chose the word i think Jan is janani is better yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so uh, uh, all those stays, problems it all stays away from other bodies yeah. yes i know i know well you have sure. a very very sacred duty there, and God help you. <laughs> yeah, somebody's flashed up your yeah. because it's different from other of God. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's Simon or something. Yeah. yeah. Probably sounds. You are only distinct from other of God. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, if nobody has any question, then we can close today's session and uh, let. Let me then before then announce one thing that next session we will have on 8th August, yeah? Yes, not next week. No. Yeah. I think I also need a breather yeah. and um, I I might, I think, um, just a trailer, um, I think I might do theosis or yoga, whichever people feel is more important, I don't know. But yoga may be more important immediately, I don't know. And maybe leave it to theosis to the one after. Uh, yoga, somebody's flashing. Yeah. <laughs> I think let's have a look at yoga next week on postural and meditative. I've, I've been doing so much rewrites of yoga of late. It, I could probably talk in sleep from it, you know, and <laughs> in my sleep because uh, I'm just preparing an article for a book on the yoga. And so I, I, I don't have as much work to do for that. So let's do, let's uh, look at yoga and hesychastic prayer and Maybe if I have time, a bit of um, Gregory Palamas, but uh, that requires a paper in itself, so it's not easy to do that in the same one. I have cut out a large section from Bhakti, and sometimes we can come back to that, which is the whole idea of female goddess, cults, god, and uh, and uh, Kali and mother god, all these things, and and the mother of God, you know, the kind of um, role they play in, in the two traditions. It needs a talk by itself and I didn't want to squeeze too much into this. Let's hope. I, I'm thinking I'm, I will probably be able to do another two or three sessions and then I have to stop. I may be going away and we can always resume later before Christmas or something like that. Maybe not necessarily a talk format. We may just have question and answer um, format. Or, you know, people present questions beforehand we can discuss that, you know, whatever. Let's see. Yeah. 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 Hopefully another couple of sessions, uh, you know, uh, and I come, come back on the 8th and let's see how it goes. Yeah. 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 Let's hope for that. Yeah. Thank you Thanks. very much. Thanks. In yeah. joining today and enlightening us on this very important uh, theme. We are looking forward to our next meeting. Thank you very much. God bless you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you very much and all of you.